Well, Julian Assar, candidate for New Hampshire governor, looking to be the nominee of the NHGOP. Welcome to Agrock Gauntlet. Thank you. And uh, we will keep you amused or disheartened for the next two hours. All right. And because uh, we always have plenty of questions to ask. So, for our readers, uh, and again, the rules of engagement are uh, this is being recorded. And when we have interviewed all of the candidates for governor that have agreed to come in, uh, we will be putting the videos up so that our readers can see it. We consider ourselves representatives of them uh, because we've been told very much of the time we write about things that interest them and we get to say things that they wish they could say and they can't. So I look at it as when Granite Rock was first opened, it was for me. Now the responsibility has come on for our constituencies. Just yes. even though we are on a, well, we are elected every day by how many times people come and vote by reading for us. So yes, that's how we look at it. But again, I want to say thank you, and let's get the show on the road. Um, what is the proper role of government? proper role of government here in the United States and what should be globally if they were so lucky as we were to have our founding would be to protect the unalienable rights of the individual, the structure of the republic and how it's supposed to operate and the constitution and our respective state constitutions. So the government would take a, uh, a back seat to states' rights, would take a back seat to our everyday lives and wouldn't tell us what we can or can't do, what we can and can't eat, smoke, drink. It would pretty much stay out of our personal choices, just draw that line in between when we start to infringe upon another person's right to do the same. Oh, well, that's excellent. Um, <coughs> do you think that uh, even New Hampshire state governments have got out of hand? And what would you do to change it, or how would you attempt to change it? So it has got out of hand, and it honestly, it's been out of hand for a very long time. We, we used to be a red state, but for all intents and purposes, the old school GOP that didn't really mean a whole lot. I mean, I'm a fan of Ronald Reagan to a degree because he also created the police state, he also armed the police like a military unit. And we saw how that's worked out so far. We've created entire generations of men who've been locked up. And recidivism is at an all-time high, but we haven't fixed the problem. There is no rehabilitation in getting back into productive society. New Hampshire is no different. We have a whole lot of, quote-unquote, Reagan Republicans who are fire and brimstone towards everything that they do not like but they don't understand that Reagan, JFK, Eisenhower, and Donald Trump focused on providing solutions to problems. Not on the rhetoric, not on propping up their own political campaigns, not on their own egos, to a degree. <laughs> well, you, you, they've all got egos because they have to have, but you're right. You they, can't be a politician without being a narcissist to, no. to some degree. <clears throat> but they, they focused <laughs> on fixing stuff for the people. Yes. Well, the we don't We've, uh, and I, I've been toying around with this because we were, we were talking about it at Porkfest with the Libertarians. They don't like our First in Nation status. Personally, I disagree with them. I like our First in Nation status. I like being the state that vets presidential candidates. I love the idea that we can absolutely destroy a candidate's campaign because the local plumber knows more about the Constitution than half the politicians running for office. I absolutely love that. But... Uh, his point was that the amount of establishment characters, the amount of money and lobbyists that come through such a small state like New Hampshire, basically it's like we're the 300 running up against the Persians. No matter how hard we fight, we eventually get trampled over. Because what was it, the phrase is um, the New Hampshire State House represents the people, the Senate represents the lobbyists. That That's kind of how it feels here a yeah. lot of the time. And the to a degree over the past, uh, I want to say over the past 10 years, uh, primarily, 
the Sununus, or at least since Elder Sununu was in office, uh, they've pretty much run the entire state. So the state senators all get voted in at their leisure. They get endorsements, and of course, once you get an endorsement, you never talk crap about the the guy that endorsed you. You never publicly disagree with him, which means you're not holding people accountable. We have a lot. We have a apathetic mindset in a state where we have so much power as citizens. We often don't vote in our town elections. We don't vote in runoff elections or special elections. Or I'm sorry, we don't have runoffs here, but we don't vote in special elections. Uh, we don't knock doors, wave signs, donate to candidates, except up until recently, we forgot the activist side of being conservatives and Republicans. We try to legislate what we should be doing in the community ourselves. And the First Nation is kind of, has brought that attitude here. Uh, the, the establishment people who come into state, they bring that very Beltway DC attitude. You can see how it's infected the Institute of Politics. Yeah. You see Beltway logic coming out of there. That's, we're not a Beltway state. We're the only state in the country where you can literally knock every door to win an election. Where you, you have to go sit in a mom and pop shop and get grilled. Like presidents, uh, presidential candidates can't come here and do a rally and then leave. No, 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 you gotta come, you gotta knock doors. You gotta earn being here. Okay. We sort of lost that. I mean, I, I, what I love is the ability to kind of kick the tires and kick the shins of the pol politicians as they come through. Mm -hmm. Off you, you go, Skip. Well, I like the way that you put that. I was going to save this till a little later on. But today was, I think, one of the most important decisions over the last two weeks that the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, did, which I am hoping that you heard that the EPA got slapped down hard. And for our readers, Mm -hmm. who aren't always, uh, it's going to come up. I, I put up a breaking story, but I've got, got to follow it up. Essentially, it's a case of the EPA was ruled out of bounds, not following its authorizing legislation, and uh, grabbing a power that it did not have in stating it could regulate CO2 emissions from coal plants. Yes. The SCOTUS said six to three, no, you cannot because that power to regulate CO2 as a pollutant is not one that you have. Mm -hmm. And you have overstepped your boundaries. Therefore, we tell you to cease and desist and remand it back to the lower courts to actually carry this through. In effect, it was the first major howitzer round coming at the administrative state. I'm quite sure that the federal level, there's going to be a lot of ramifications. But if you were to be elected, yes, how would you use this decision here in the state of New Hampshire? Is it necessary? And if so, where? And how would you reel in rogue departments and agencies? So it is necessary, and it is definitely relevant to our state. So. Almost every executive agency uses their ability to to create policy, uh, which the 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 legislature, either at the federal level or the state level, does not give executive offices the ability to legislate. You do not have the whole craft ability to make and enforce law. This is a power that was never ever given to the legislature to to delegate their own authority. They were never in these executive branch uh, agencies were never given the authority to be able to whole cloth make and enforce their own laws against citizens. I mean, by all means, have your own internal policies between each other with your own employees, the same any company or corporation would do. But you don't get to tell me that, say, uh, like the ATF is my favorite example. They love changing the definition of words to criminalize everyday actions by citizens. So changing a AR, a short barrel AR into a pistol. Changing a, a arm brace into a butt stock or vice versa. It, it's negligible to the actual meaning and functioning of a firearm. It means absolutely nothing. But they do it and it's a flex of power. In this state, as governor, I don't have the I don't have a universal authority to wind it back, 
but as governor dealing with our executive agencies, I can tell them when they're stepping out of bounds. I can wheel them back. And then I can also give them the power to execute, uh, to properly execute when they should be. Like Frank Edelblum wants to execute and deal with some of the, the CRT complaints and some of the complaints he's gotten regarding divisive concepts. But you have the executive branch that doesn't enforce it. So we, we have a lot of issues in the state regarding executive agencies not doing what they're supposed to do. And if this continues to turn out the way it should, I'm assuming there will be massive ramifications, particularly with the DEA, ATF, uh, FBI, and one of my favorites, DOT. Um, and we'll see a lot of things start to get overturned where they basically grab the power they are never supposed to have. Just a follow-up question. And here in the state. <clears throat> would you, by executive order or some other means, because you would you are or would be the main executive, yes. tell the departments you will, in the space of X amount of time, tell me what you are doing and what you're doing that is not directly in your authorizing legislation, and then post oh, yes. it. I would love to. Oh yes, I would definitely do that. Because to be honest, what what I wish Trump had done was go into office with a list of executive orders that he was going to repeal and overturn of executive actions and just go, all right, well, here's a whole bunch of policy and regulation. Here's an entire list of, say, 30,000 different regulations that we're just getting rid of. And I'm going to sign it right now. You have 30 days to codify these in law. They weren't my power. I'm not supposed to have it in the first place. To be honest, I'd like to give power back to the state legislature. A follow-up, sir? And, and, you know, that's that's a problem, I think, with legislatures nationwide. I've, I've observed frequently, and we know the history goes back further, but in particular since about the 1960s, the, the national legislature has been cowardly and just created and authorized agencies to do the things that they didn't want to take the heat for. Yes, and it's the... The legislators created turned the president into a front man or a fall guy, where the entire guts of D.C. operates basically unaccountable. You have 30, 40 year politicians get completely, re they get consistently reelected to office, but no substance of D.C. actually ever changes because the people who are responsible for screwing everything up are still there. You're getting rid of the executive, but all they got to do is wait out until they have a better executive or they have another shot. They pass the buck and they let executives wield uh, their power like dictators as often as possible because, well, we can just, instead of us doing it ourselves, we can let this guy do it. He'll take the fall for it if it doesn't work out. It was kind of what we were seeing with Biden is the is his 50 years of abject failure on every single policy. I mean, by just sheer law of statistics, he should have gotten at least one right in 50 <laughs> years. But we're seeing that when you take a entire basket of wrong thing and you stick it into an executive position where there is zero accountability and everyone in Congress is willing to pass the buck. We're watching the country fail. And to be honest, I don't know if there's anything that we're going to do that's going to fix it. But we can damn sure try. My, my follow-up question to that is most of this stems from the 1948 Administrative Act at the federal level. Yes. And we, the one that, I forget when it happened, but that created J.L. Carr, which is uh, the Senate and the House overseeing and uh, approving or disapproving, mostly approved, yes. uh, regulations from our executive branch here in New Hampshire. Yes. Most of that comes because legislators are lazy. They yes. don't do their job. You know, like the, the patriots that were winning all the time. We just have to do our jobs. Too often they're lazy. They don't want to do the, the amount of detail necessary to do uh, legislation correctly. Mm -hmm. They just say, well, we'll write most of it, sort of, and then throw it over the wall to the executive branch bureaucrats who will then write uh, guidance rules and regulations that magically become law. 
Yes. So my question would be, if you were to be handed a piece of legislation that was crafted by the House and the Senate, passed, duly passed by both, and if you saw that this thing's full of holes that would have to be fixed by my bureaucrats, people working in my branch of government, mm -hmm. would you be willing to say, I'm vetoing this right now, take it back, and fill in the details? Yes. Whole cloth. I, it's the idea that we need to pass legislation and then send it over to executives and bureaucratic agencies and hope that they may know how to fill in the gaps. The research should be done prior to passing the legislation, not after the fact. That is a, that is a horrible recipe for getting uh, regulations to trample on people's rights and their livelihoods and destroy lives. And it's exactly how you get one-off policy at the federal or state level that doesn't properly filter down to localities in any way that allows them to tailor it to their own specific issues. Wow. Um, clearly you know what you would do or should do as governor. How do you get to be governor? Well, let's see. <laughs> uh, I, I should start at the origin. Well, so, you're doing a grot gauntlet, so there you go. Yeah, uh, so I'll start at the origin. When I started running, uh, when I was running for Congress, uh, I was asked multiple times by people to switch and run for governor because people were sick of the sick of Sununu. And this is prior to Thad announcing, and um, Karen has been running. Uh, so obviously she was already in the race. Uh, but I was asked to run, and it was by a lot of our Liberty reps who just got sick of the governor just screwing us. Well, originally I said no. And I said no because, well, half the people who asked me were still carrying water for the governor still wouldn't publicly come out and say anything negative about him. I'm like, well, why am I going to be the whipping post or be your sacrificial lamb for something you're not willing to do yourself? Like, I need to see you put skin in the game. So now we're at the point where uh, the governor has outright trashed the previous president, Donald Trump. He's trashed his state legislature, his own party, his own base, the, the average voter in the state. He's gotten to the point where apparently he doesn't believe that anybody in the state is a Republican except him. I believe the path to being governor is by actually running on a solution to, to people's problems in their everyday lives. By respecting the voters, and even when I disagree with what they have to say, I am still required to listen to them because I'm their employee. That's how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I would expect my employees to, to listen to what I have to say, even with even if they disagree. I mean, their job is to answer to me, and my job is to make sure things get done. I think my job is to answer to voters. So when I did my interview with Adam Sexton uh, early this week, he asked me if I felt that by allying myself with uh, Trini, uh, Therese Grinnell and Frank Newhouse, at the executive council meeting where they were both arrested, uh, where Frank at the previous meeting had used, uh, say, uh, in no uncertain terms, pos uh, could be construed as threats. Uh, the, I know where you live, we know, and all of that. He asked if I was tacitly uh, approving or tacitly endorsing that behavior. I said no. No, because even when I disagree with them, and I've already spoken to Frank about how I disagreed with the first executive meeting, and I was still there to support them in the second meeting because it was a serious issue. It was a serious issue that required me to be there and hear their redress of grievances because they weren't being heard. And the way you create radicals is by continuing to ignore them. It's like walking through Kmart and your kid keeps trying to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you. Well, finally they throw a temper tantrum. That's how you create a radical, is you, st you keep ignoring them. You stop uh, addressing the issues that are important to them. So I believe being governor, you fight for the people. Like an activist would, just with a little less throat punching. <laughs> okay, um, this question I'm gonna plagiarize from Rick Notkin. 
and uh, you originally meant this for a different race. But since you started off answering my question, what is the proper role of government? And you came out and basically paraphrased the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Is to protect our liberties. What steps would you take to retrieve freedoms that have been taken away by legislation? Repealing legislation in the day and age that we live in is almost impossible, specifically because there are so many other people involved in that mix. Because it's not, the governor can't do it by himself. So the good news is we have enough strong candidates running all over the state right now, primarying old rhinos, primarying uh, the establishment, that we might very well be able to bring some of these old pieces of legislation up and get rid of them. Like there, the amount of pieces of legislation that should be re-looked at are innumerable. But there's, and there's a lot of legislation that we should be passing where we have, uh, in exchange for federal dollars, we have given up a little bit of state sovereignty to the, to the federal government. And I disagree with that. If we're gonna say that we actually have a, a balanced state budget, we should actually balance it. We shouldn't be weight uh, contributing to the national debt and the national deficit. Especially if we as conservatives are complaining about the national debt and national deficit. You can't speak out of both sides of your mouth at once. Mike? Do you think there's anything we can do to um, reverse the process whereby this, the federal government taxes the citizens and then bribes the states to oppress the citizens, which is essentially what it's doing. I have a dream, as somebody said once upon a time, <laughs> that we should invert the tax process, that the states should be levied in proportion to their budgets to cause them to race to the bottom in terms of cost to the citizen. But Seriously, do you think there's anything can be done to reverse the, the process of essentially bribery and oppression that's essentially applied to the states? Not short of passing the convention of states. Because it would really, we would have to go back to where the states reassert their control over the federal government rather than the other way around. And you would have to have a compliant Congress, which I'm going to be honest and say, regardless of who goes to Congress in this uh, 2022 cycle, I doubt that any of them are going to make a big dent. Knowing them all personally, liking them all as people, I, I, I doubt I doubt that any of them are going to make a big dent. And it's just because, well, almost all of them have some ties to party and house leadership. The only one who really doesn't is uh, Tim Baxter. And this is an endorsement of his campaign. It's just he's the only one who doesn't have connections to those who are the movers and shakers in the, in the House and in D.C. He's got Rand Paul and Thomas Massey, who are two bomb throwers themselves. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Everybody else has some somebody that they were endorsed by or that they they've worked with or worked under and I, I've had my criticisms with them behind closed doors but the, the point is one man in DC can make a difference but isn't in a legislature won't be the difference in the in the executive agency obviously we saw Trump made huge waves but still one man couldn't get it all done what we only need to do with the executive agencies is to close a bunch of them. The problem is you need legislation to do that. Some of them were created through executive orders, though, through executive action, so you can close those. But the problem is, uh, and I said this, you, you see many candidates running around saying, we're going to ban the Department of Education. I'm like, you don't have the power to do that. Stop making promises you can't keep. You're one of 535 people in D.C. and 534 people in D.C. disagree with you. I was like, well, no, no, because I'll count, I'll count Rand and Thomas Massey and that. So 500, and, let's say 530 
disagree with you. <laughs> There's a few others that, that would agree with it, but they don't have the balls to actually do it. Yeah, so and a lot of people talk a good game, but wouldn't do it if they actually had the power to. The reality is the federal government, the Department of Education, doesn't make up the curriculum at the local level. It doesn't. But that's we, not necessarily true anymore. Well, no, because they don't do it themselves, but they work with teachers unions and administrative unions to do, do the same thing. So they're not doing it kind of way the U.S. government isn't spying on us anymore, but instead they just buy all of our data from Facebook, Google, and uh, Twitter instead. So they, they're they still spying on us, just we're signing up to do it. Let me go back to uh, Mike's question on the budget. Strings of cash has been a big deal for me. I spent almost 10 years on my, my town's uh, SB2 budget committee. Mm -hmm. I forever railed against taking things that caused us to spend money. The bandstand built back in the 1970s. Well, if you don't keep it in good repair, you have to pay the money back with interest. The outdoor uh, skating rink made out of metal that rusts. Yep. Um, same thing. Then there's the sidewalk for nowhere, which we then found out after a year or so, oh, we gotta keep it plowed oh, our trucks can't do that. Now we gotta buy special stuff to do this with? Yep. So the strings always add up. But what most people don't understand here in New Hampshire, when they talk, people talk about the budget. We're real, the, the legislature and the executive branch are really arguing over a very small piece of the entire set of money that's spent here because the federal government gives us about 70% of the entire budget, yep. most of which is through health and human services. Now that interest rates are starting to climb up, what would you do with all that said? I know Steve gives me a hard time because I go rambling on setting up the, the example here. Things are going to get real tight and a lot of that money is going to go away. What would you do if that 70% became 35 percent how would you handle that we're going to have to because tighten. there's no more money we're going to have to tighten the belt that means we're going to actually have to cut spending we're going to have to stop with special projects that do not directly benefit the citizens parks and stuff like that look i have three kids i would love my kids to be able to play on a park in every town and state but the reality is when people are struggling to put food on their table when they're struggling to, to pay their their electricity, their propane, their heating oil, put gas in their car. I fill up my tank probably three, four times a week right now. It's about 100, 115, 130 bucks, depending on how we're fluctuating and how much Biden wants to grift by opening up the strategic oil reserve. But the all these tiny little projects that people see, they go, ah, it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, but if every town in the state's got a drop in the bucket, all of a sudden the bucket becomes really heavy. If all of a sudden every single project has to be approved, every single solution has to come from the state, not from the local area. If, we're, if we as conservatives say that there's something that isn't the role of government, we need to start taking care of it privately. That means we need to crowd, crowd, start crowdfunding some of the stuff we want done without government. We need to start tightening the belt. We also, we need to bring back industry here. We have the, we have lost most of our industry. All this uh, talk about a rail, a railway in New Hampshire, which is the dumbest damn thing on the planet. It is a antiquated idea from the days where we used to have an industry that could have supported it. We don't. Now, Amtrak and all the other trains, originally they were built during a time when there was industry that could have supported that. We don't have that. There's no level of passenger ridership that's going to passenger ridership that's going to make that feasible. But we have a lot of people trying to uh, accomplish their own particular agenda. We got a lot of senators and state reps who are trying to pander to their towns and are not willing to tell their towns the truth that no, we can't do that. We can't do it because we don't have the money. With the, that hypothetical cut in half. 
normally people always say that a budget is nothing but a set of priorities with dollar signs after it. Such a cut would necessitate real priorities to mm -hmm. be done. And it's generally the governor who proposes the budget to begin with. Yes. How would you reset those priorities? Would that be you, you and your inner sanctum? Would you appeal to the legislators as well? Would you include private citizens? Because you're talking many things, mm -hmm. as you just said, pox in every town, that get chopped right off the bat. Well, Which goes back to my original question yes. to tie everything together. What is the proper role of government? Because this would expose what isn't. So a good leader, one of the primary functions of good leader is to know where everyone under him skills fit to, to put each person properly within their lane where they can be effective. Knowing that, I know that no leader knows everything. I'm a pretty well-researched individual. I do a lot of research on legis legislation and history to find out exactly how we got to the place that we're in. The role of government, again, we need to get right back to where we started as, where the government's job was to protect our rights and our property. And it's the structure of how the government was designed to operate. That means we're actually going to have to cut out a lot. We're going to have to get way down to necessities. And that does mean that I'm going to have to partner and <coughs> act with the state, with the state legislature, with citizens, with private companies who have good ideas and solutions to problems. That means we're going to have to work together. And we spend a whole lot of time, specifically on our side of the aisle, stabbing each other in the chest in public. Democrats take care of their shit behind closed doors. We do ours out in public and we sell tickets to the event. At two per se. Yes. <laughs> oh yes. We have a we have a bad habit of uh, and, and what's the old adage? Uh, me and Keith Hansen, we we have discussed this many times, and he basically said, uh, Democrats will work on, with each other on the nine out of ten things that they agree on, and they'll leave that tenth thing off to the side. Republicans will agree on nine out of ten things and we will kill each other over the ten thing and refuse to work on the other nine. That's probably a good way of putting it. Yeah, we are very, very individualistic to the point where it is almost impossible to build a coalition with each other. Now, I will say this, this legislative cycle, <coughs> that was a completely different story. I saw the best coalition building I've seen in this state in a long time. And we actually got a lot done. Yeah, I think one of the few problems, well, both a bad and a good point, was the parental rights bill. Yes. Where the individual legislators, during the process, really wanted to kill it. And while it may cause me to squirm a little bit, I have to congratulate Chuck Morse and Sherm Packard yep. for stepping in and getting it through the conference of the committee. Oh, yeah? Now, then the discipline failed when it came time for the House vote. Yes. And part and that's of that's okay. Granite Rock's going to target each and every one of them. So that was partially, and I will say the governor's partially to blame for that, too. Because we all know the power of political pressure from the bully pulpit. When he said that he didn't like it and that he would not sign it, well, that gave license, and then sat up there and said that uh, it could open up to persecution for, for trans children. Beside getting away from the whole transgender thing, because I could go off on a tangent about that for hours, how stupid that is. But the Attorney General was wrong. He was absolutely full of it. There was nothing in that bill that could have resulted in persecution of young children. Just don't talk about sex to children. Don't talk about your personal life, about your your uh, Johnny's two mommies. No, just leave people's kids alone. Would have been fine. But through the governor and the AG being able to uh, push that narrative, they affected some of the uh, state reps who have family members who are LGBT. 
QIA plus uh, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> not enough stripe on the flag. Yeah, there's not there's not <laughs> enough. It's it, and there's a new stripe every day. Um, but the the point is they were able to manipulate people, and there was not enough education on that bill and the legal side of it and the ramifications of it, which goes back to what you were saying earlier. Not enough people look down the line at when you write a piece of legislation, say you have a project, that sidewalk, that means you're going to have to plow it, that means you're going to have to upkeep it, that means you're going to have to have markers for it, that means you're going to have to, you're going to, have to hire somebody else, that means another salary. It, it, the, the long view of things doesn't often get brought up when we're talking about what's going on right now. It's often the, well, I have a problem right now, we need to solve it right now, we'll worry about the repercussions later. And that's when you're you're affecting people's paychecks, their property taxes, or whether most of our elderly are going to be able to stay in their houses because their property taxes have been soaring for the past five years. It's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal to me. I'm thinking of uh, moving and shrinking. I'm selling my house right now um, because so throughout the throughout the pandemic, my wife was off out of work for about nine months. Uh, out of that nine months, when she because she's a preschool teacher, mm -hmm. so she already doesn't make a lot, but I made a good amount. Um, when she went back to work, she was in and out of work like every couple of weeks based on whatever kid popped positive or had a sniffle or whatever. So we kept losing income. And then on top of it, because of COVID, we had uh, investment properties out in California that we couldn't collect on. So we're losing money there too. So we've lost consistently, we've lost, I'd say about a third of our income every month for almost two years. And on top of that, my company, is down almost 15% on profit margins right now because we've had a 3% cost of living increase we're supposed to get each year that we have not been able to get because negotiations on cost of living throughout the pandemic were closed altogether. And on top of that, we're paying for gas for our employees to get to and from work. And then the increased prices on uh, cleaning supplies and equipment and stuff. And the increased gas is... is probably going to triple before the end of the Biden administration, regardless of whether we get Republicans in the House or not. So I got to the point where my propane has doubled. My electricity has doubled and is about to double again. My gas in my car went from filling up three times a week to filling up four times a week, but the cost of each fill up has doubled. I've invested every I threw in every investment that I had because when all this started, I was pissed off because nobody who actually has to deal with the ramifications of these stupid ass policies is serving in DC. None of them, not one of them live a real life. Not one of them have ever had to worry about whether or not they're going to eat or whether or not they're going to, their families are going to eat. Not one of them have skipped a meal so they could put food on the table. So I was pissed and I jumped into the race. Now in the governor's race, uh, basically I've, I've lost faith that DC is going to change. But it still holds true in the governor's race. I'm at the point now where between all the costs have gone up and all the money that I've eaten, and then I invested my own money, my own investments, my own, I closed out investments and stuff to invest in this race to make a difference. I saw my house or I lose my house. Because I'm, I'm basically in the same position as most of the elderly people in the state. Property taxes will push me out. Gas and cost of living uh, across the board. Groceries, and that's not including groceries. Friggin' chicken used to be the cheapest damn thing you could buy. Now, for the exact same pack, it's about $6 more. So you are all in on this. Oh, I'm all in. Because it, it is, we either solve the problem. I used to be a decently well-off guy. I, I made over six figures. I lived a decent life. I had a classic car. I sold my classic car. I, I cashed out my investments. I threw everything into making a difference. When I write political strategy for people in other states, 
I don't charge them. Because it's not about me, it's about the movement. I could charge them. By all means, throughout this process of running for Congress, I was offered jobs in D.C. I turned them down. I actually, the day that Sununu decided not to run for Senate, I got asked to run for Senate against Don Bolduc. Don is my guy. So obviously my answer was somewhere along the lines of, hell no, uh, with not, uh, it starts with an F. <laughs> yes, of Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, but and then you'll notice that I picked up on those shenanigans early on. Oh yes, my, so my I, wrote, article, I wrote those couple of pieces of rich Senate losers. Yeah, uh, uh, my, I, that's a plug for articles on the Rock, of course. Oh yes, my my whole. <coughs> so I got the phone call literally 15 minutes after because I was standing next to a couple state reps. We were waiting for Jerry DeLumis. Uh, his bus was meeting us uh, up off the 95. So when. The phone call came in, we were watching the report live on our phones, and then immediately everyone started picking up the phone, and everyone over the age of 30 in the state got a phone call. Like, everyone that could run. I got my phone call right, literally right after, and I got multiple phone calls throughout the day from all over the state, and you could probably think of who has a vendetta against Don Bullock and want him to have somebody primary. And their thought process was, well, me and Don have the same base. We have similar backgrounds. We have similar uh, life experience. He is just older, shorter, and whiter than me. But we're like, we're identical on policy. <laughs> but their idea was that I would be able to bridge the gap between Don's voters and the more moderates and independents. And when they said it, I go, no, 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 no. no. Like, Don is, I already endorsed Don. Don has always been my guy. But the point is, if I were to be the shady person that I've been accused of being and taking payment to, to jump into a race, I already would have done it. Millions of dollars to jump into a race to go to the Senate. I would have taken six-figure jobs in D.C. I would have moved out and been chief of staff for a couple congressmen or candidates in Texas. Uh, it's almost like you're you're keying it up for me because you're saying something that I was going to ask a question about, and I was going to ask because I, <clears throat> if you've been reading Granite Rock, you know I bring a lot of stuff back from a site called Tree Hugger, yes, eco socialist, and I've actually been on the case of one of the major writers, if not the major writer, um, and I kind of ranted about okay, you want to get rid of this for me. Basically, you want to electrify everything. So you want to get rid of my propane heater. You want to get rid of my wood stove. Mm -hmm. So how much are you going to pay me because your policy is going to hurt me and my family? Shouldn't you, as a result of creating that policy, have some skin in the game? Which is exactly what you were talking about. All these legislators, all these policy makers are creating things that hurt people. And they don't they don't affect them. It because not. when you have I mean these people, most of them have F U money. They have never have to miss, skip a meal in their entire lives money. You can have thirty thousand dollar ice freezers with uh, rare ice cream with pearls in it and crap. That it's they don't live in reality. Yeah. So my question is Bringing it, it's, it's very easy to see in D.C. A lot of these advocacy groups, and I consider Tree Hunter to be its own eco-socialist advocacy group. Yes. And they don't like me playing in there. <laughs> uh, but a few other like-minded folks are playing more of a role and holding them to account. The question is, here in New Hampshire, we have a lot of very well-off people, far more well-off than what you have described. Yes. Um, and I can think of many that are far worse than I am. Mm -hmm. um, and they're struggling right now. Is, this is a hypothetical because I know no legislation would ever happen, but if you were king for the day, what would you do to say, going forward, 
if somebody is hurt by your policy, you are going to have skiing again. Or if I see that your policy will hurt somebody, I'm going to do everything I can to stop it and then stop you. See, the second one I could do. The second one I could do. I, I could definitely stall out the policy because likelihood of us having a supermajority. Um, the way the state party is acting right now is slim. Slim to none. But the, the first one, um, I don't know. It's it's hard because this is something that the, the left has actually been advocating for for years. Is that uh, any politician who votes against gun laws would reap the repercussions of voting against that gun laws and be able to be personally sued every time there's a mass shooting or there's gun crime. And when I look at that, I, I see if the policy is solely the responsibility of the legislators, and I mean it, does, it did come down to malpractice on the part of an executive agency or malpractice on the part of uh, a government employee or somebody throughout that chain. But it was, you created a policy that resulted in you say, coming in my house and uh, shooting up my dog with fentanyl every, every couple of days. And yeah, I would say by all means, by all means, because something's gotta give you got an entire legislature, you got uh, exe uh, elected officials with no repercussions. And I get it, in this state it's hard because uh, we don't have the, the money game that most states do when it comes to being an elected official because you get paid like a hundred bucks a year. But, and most of the problems we have are ego problems in the state. And ego can be just as dangerous as money when it comes to power. Well, isn't that the real coin of the realm, power? Even if you're not getting a paycheck or if you're getting a big paycheck? Oh yeah, that's part of the reason why you have, I, so my introduction to politics was Phil Constantino, police chief in Acton Senate, was wielding his power like a dictator. My dad was on the budget committee and refused to pass Phil Constantino's budget, if I remember correctly. He was trying to, he was also town selectman, and he was head of the elderly affairs committee, uh, Phil Constantino was. He had been police chief for over 35 years in Atkinson. And my dad had the gall to say that it was, it was a uh, violation of ethics to present as police chief a, your raise and then to walk around to sit in the selectman's chair and to vote on your own race, to approve your own race. So we ended up getting harassed for a couple of years. And then my dad ended up suing Phil Constantino. Now, Billy Baldwin, his lieutenant at that time, is now still in Atkinson, causing his own bullshit. And if I remember correctly, he just got kicked out of Pennsylvania for, um, uh, I think he was de serving down there as a police chief while he has a residence up here and there's a selectman up here. Ooh, that's naughty. Like yes. he is claiming a residence in two, a primary residence in two separate states at the same time, resulted in him getting fired. Fired, yep. Yeah, yeah, I wonder. So my, my uh, that process of my, my dad and me being, and my family being harassed by Phil Constantino built the character that I have. It is, I saw the corruption of even small town governments. You don't have to be Chicago to be hopelessly corrupt. And we have it right here in New Hampshire and it's people who have ego issues. The money's not there, but the ego <coughs> is still there. Sure, and, and Andrew Napolitano always called it uh, libido domini, the lust to dominate. Yes. Well, we I agree that we have a lot of corruption, and unfortunately one of the greatest anti-corruption fighters this state has seen in a long time passed away recently, Ed Nail. Yep. Um, so Ed Nail actually worked on that case to expose Phil Constantino. He was, I've known Ed since I was about 12 years old, 
So he, he helped us with that. Very good. I did not know that. So my question is, the Attorney General's office, out in the Liberty and Freedom slash Conservatarian wing of the party, mm -hmm. doesn't exactly hold them in high regard for a lot of different ways. A lot of it is election fraud. Yes. Um, all I have to do is point to our friend James O'Keefe. Yes. Um, who uh, uncovered quite a bit. And then the Attorney General decided to go after him, in fact, uh, Dick Tracy, which yes. came here looking for James O'Keefe to Mike's home. And then he dropped his folder and my picture popped out of it. So we're well aware of who gets the, the political thumb. It wasn't on only the Dick Tracy that came here. It was another. What? I thought it was. No, it was one of their other. Um, oh, Dick Head. That's it. Yeah. Richard Head. <laughs> yes. It, you know, there should be a special place <laughs> in in uh, Hades for people who do this to their children. Yeah. They really. They, they really should. But. I'm not going to lie. Dick Tracy is a pretty awesome name, though. Because I still remember the comic book in the movie. Yes. But James, James O'Keefe, in his last <coughs> time here, talked about uh, Dick Tracy, Dick Head, and Dick Sweat. <laughs> and what he, what the three of them had done to him. So, anyways. Yeah, that's how <laughs> the guy, as he came in with his briefcase, with his folders, wanted to sort of paper on James O'Keefe because he had reason to believe James O'Keefe was going to stay here before an event. Except that James O'Keefe was famously running at the last minute. And I was able to call him and say, uh, I think you better not come. Yeah. There you go. So, but anyways, with that said, and it's a great little story, um, what would you do about this? Since you, I did not know the story that Ed Neal had helped your family mm -hmm. expose this. So you, you're intimately uh, acquainted with what can go on. As governor, what would you do about it? Because Doug Lambert and I, who founded uh, Grant Rock with me, we often said, a la, um, oh gosh, Speaker of Massachusetts, name escapes. Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill famously said, all politics is local. Yes, it is. We turned that into, listen to what we're having to say, because if it's happening in our town, it's probably happening in your town even if it's just a little sideways. Oh, yeah. So knowing that, is there something that you could instruct your um, agencies to do to help people who are undergoing this kind of problem? First, I think we need a new AG. I think we need a new AG, and we need to start really tackling government corruption, whether it's at the town level or at a city level or at the state level. People, there has to be consequences when people do the wrong thing. Honestly, that's what this whole damn election is about. I mean, running against Sununu, against the machine, you, would you believe that the, the criticism that I get the most is, oh my God, you're, going, you're ruining any potential you have of a political career in the state. I'm going, I don't know, what the hell made you think I want a political career in this state? Screw that. I mean, you see what you guys say on a regular basis, like, oh, we should just accept the corruption because that's just how politics works. I'm like, that's like saying that I should accept the fact that my wife is cheating on me. Then when I ask her about it, she denies it. I tell her I know that she's lying. She shows, not only shows no remorse, but says she's going to do it again. There's not shit I can do about it. I'm like, are we are the problem. And it's not just the people in office. It's the average voter, too. I'm a, I'm a big fan of telling the truth. When we got a problem, we have a we have a problem internally. We have a lot of people who say they want to get rid of corruption until it's their guy that's being corrupt, or their guy violating the Constitution, or their guy trampling on somebody's rights. We as voters, we excuse politicians. We make excuses for them because we like them. I mean, to be honest, is one of the biggest downsides of both Trump and Obama, and I'm going to use them both for the same reason, because on the left, the left do not look at Obama as a man. They look at him like a deity. 
And for the people who love Trump on the right, we look at him like a deity, which means when they screw up, when Obama screwed the left, they had nothing to say. When Trump passed that bump stock ban, we had shit to say <coughs> about the uh, whole thing. All I'm sudden, not so sure I agree with that, personally. <laughs> no, there were a few. There were a few, but I saw far many more people going, eh, bump stocks, who uses a bump stock? I'm like, you're the problem. You're the problem, because this was supposed to be our red line in the sand. Because they, they will nibble at your rights until they're on the left. Yeah, they, they just keep going, oh, well, you know, most people don't care about this one, so we'll, we'll ax that one. And then they go down the scale, or they they climb the ladder of how much you care about it, until finally it's your head getting chopped off. So we need, heads need to roll. Yes. People need to get fired, and we need an AGU who's going to start bringing people up on charges. I mean, to be honest, I understand the low-level criminal who steals milk or bread more than I understand the person who feels the need to weaponize their power against the people around them. Yes, I'm working with a case like that right now. <laughs> yes, I'm the Gunstock Area Commission. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. The things <clears throat> I hear coming out of that commission, I'm like... It, it is endless oh, reading. Oh, trust me. Every time I, I think I know eight, what's going eight, on, eight I, I get more information. I'm like, oh, it gets so much worse. Oh, yes, it does. And, uh, Skip's keeping them honest and they're shuddering. Oh, oh they, to, to be they honest. not liking me. To be honest, it is the, um, that is the story of major projects like that nationwide. When I was, after I got out of the Marine Corps, and uh, right before starting Celebrity Protection, when I was still in training and everything, I did security for casinos. And I trained their security staff and use of force and stuff like that. And I took care of the Celebrity Protection on site for concerts and all that stuff. And I gotta tell you, the, the stories I found out about how that casino was built and everything that went into it, and all the shady crap that happened behind closed doors. We caught a bank robber there. We caught people making fraudulent government ID cards, making super bills, friggin' fake money, funny money. Oh yeah, a guy passed $50,000 at one of our blackjack tables, or one of our high roller blackjack tables. He's put up about, say, I want to say probably about maybe $70,000 and about 20 of it was real and about 50 of it was fake. And it was during the most hectic time of the night the table dropped when we're taking all the money out of the table and putting fresh boxes in. So at the, at the time when the pit boxes aren't paying attention because they're walking with us as we're doing the drop and I'm running the drop and all of a sudden I see this guy sit down and go put out his bills so they can scan the light across them. The uh, the dealer only scanned a couple bills and then that was it. They threw all the money into the drop box. So then we pulled the box out of the table and the pit box never got to verify the money. Cause that's, yeah. And it, oh I'm sorry, he didn't do it in the high roller suite cause that would have been normal in the high roller suite. They would have stopped the drop and they would have, the, but he did it at one of the main tables, which is uncharacteristic in and of itself. But the guy did it, we took the box out, and then about, I want to say an hour and a half later, the alarm goes off as they're running it through the money machine, and we shut down the entire casino. We had to go in and, I mean, literally strip the drop team down to nothing. Like, when I say nothing, nothing and search them to make sure that they didn't have anything. And we had to have them put their smocks back on and come back out of the, the money room. And when I saw the bills, I go, I know exactly who it was. I don't know exactly who it was. Went to surveillance, picked out the guy. Next time we came, he came in, we caught him trying to pass 30 more. That's but corruption that happens everywhere. And the worst part is there were people going, ah, no, that guy's a high roller. He's a regular here. It couldn't possibly be him. I go, I saw him do it. You see it happen. 
but they were willing to forgive it because he's a high roller, because he's an, an important man. Let me go back to uh, a big deal among the base that we represent. Yes. The culture wars. Yes. The law, you know, the uh, the long march through our institutions, as Antonio Gramsci, yes. the Italian socialist, has put it, and they're pretty much wiping the mat at this point. However, you mentioned transgenderism, and as you know from reading Granite Rock, I am suing my Guilford School Board mm -hmm. over their transgender policy. Not so much because I hate transgenders, because I have said, if you think you're something that you're not, go for it. If your family and friends go along with it, you know, more power to you. Don't force me to agree or affirm. And don't make me use your coerced language well, uh, well, actually, I should say the school board's coerced language. Yep. Uh, telling me I can only refer to this person by certain words, and that you codified the power that you don't have, going back to unauthorized uh, power taking of powers because we are a Dillon rule state. Yes. Of uh, being able to give yourself the power to lie to parents. Thus far. Governor Sununu has done absolutely nothing in that venue. And there's lots of other culture wars as well. Oh, we yes. Have transgenders in transgender, women's bathrooms, but, sports. Well, not just transgender, but free speech in general. We're yep. seeing the cancel culture. We're seeing the uh, absolute, not so much here in this state, but it's coming. But the, the wanton disrespect to norms. The left trying to change our norms out from underneath us. Mm -hmm. A redefinition of our common language to have words mean something other than what they actually have meant. They are introducing new words like transgender, cis heterodoxy. Yes. All right, I'm a straight guy, but now I'm cis. And now you're seeing pronouns, neo pronouns, furry pronouns. Yep. It all goes back to. Whoever controls the language controls the thinking. Yes. Those people who are trying to control the language are trying to control the culture. Yes. Is, there, is it a proper role of government when you see it connected to politics or using it as a political weapon? Is it a proper role of government to be able to say no? There's a multi-level question for you. Yes, it is, because it's, it's both a yes and no. Correct. So the government can't legislate culture, and every government that has tried has failed. Um, as a matter of fact, right here in America... But you, but you just said yes. Yes. You described no sex talk yep. to small children. Yes. That's a big part of the, of the uh, culture war right now. Yes, it is, but that's... That's also something you're not supposed, if you were to have that conversation outside of the classroom, you'd be getting arrested. If you were to talk to somebody else's child about sex outside of the classroom, you'd be getting arrested. If you were to say what we saw videos online, as a grown man twerk in front of a little girl, you'd be getting arrested for lewd and indecent exposure, for lewd, be, uh, lewd public behavior and indecent exposure and you'd be labeled a sex offender. But if you identify as a woman, regardless of whether you're wearing a dress or not, it's okay now. Because we live in Twilight Zone. All I want is we go back, we stop creating fake exceptions to laws that are already in existence. Like, perfect, uh, a good example, uh, not Technically, culture war, it combines the culture war together with their whole pushing that everybody has to have a mental disability and try to normalize mental disability or make anxiety a mental disability. Uh, red flag laws. There's no need for red flag laws. There are already laws that remove your right to own a firearm when you make malicious threats against an individual or group of individuals. Once you make a credible, violent threat against somebody, you are now a terrorist. 
you, they yeah. take your guns. Yeah. Uh, so the U of All Day shooting and Buffalo shooting, those gentlemen legally own their guns but should not have been able to have their guns, and they had paranoid schizophrenia, which also precludes them from being able to have their firearms. Because sure. paranoid schizophrenia does make you a danger to yourself and a danger to others. But in relation to the culture war, the right. issue is... A uh, very clarifying question. I'm going yes. to break in here. Yes. Should it be that the guns are taken away because we're told that guns are dangerous? Or do we take the person wielding the gun away because the person is dangerous? Technically, you shouldn't be taking the person away. You shouldn't be taking the gun away, but you should be taking the person away because the person is the dangerous entity. The, the gun is an inanimate object. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. Look, we got away from forcibly institutionalizing people. We stopped doing that in like the 80s. And for the life of me, I'll, I'll be honest, it's one of the few things I haven't researched to figure out why. Because it just, it used to be such a negligible issue, the amount of people with mental disability in society, but now, where they say one-fifth of the population has a mental disorder. I myself have anxiety and PTSD. When I got out of the Marine Corps, we, uh, I had to go through a psychological evaluation. Now, the, the military, the VA's uh, evaluation was just simply, are you a danger to yourself or others? That's it. Not whether you got a mental disability or anything like that. Just, are you a danger to yourself or others? Do you fantasize about committing violence against other people? That is pretty much it. But in relation to the culture war, the government can't legislate culture, or it should not, because it will fail. The proper way to change culture is, is to engage in it. We do the opposite. We run away from it. We being? Conservatives. The entire liberty side of the aisle. We run away from culture in, in general. We also prioritize every other career field but the arts, which is to our own detriment, because the arts are filled up with obviously left-brain people with, with people um, socially abnormal people with uh, mental disabilities and believe that men are women and that a, a 50 year old grown man can be a cat we're and that's twofold it is knowing people in that industry it is a combination of willful misconduct where they're trying to create to bring us to their Marxist proletariat revolution for the few that are actually legitimate idealists and have read Marx which most Marxists haven't and then there's the assumption the my reality is reality so because the arts and in Hollywood are so oversaturated with people of adverse lifestyles they assume that is a much greater portion of the population that lives an adverse lifestyle than actually does. So they push it and force it on everybody else, assuming that they must be stuck in the closet. Now, I know a couple people in fashion and in movies and acting and stuff out there, and they say that one in particular is a black gay guy who is a Trump supporter. Not the famous one, Rob Smith. Uh, a different one and he works in fashion he goes they don't like the fact that I'm just gay that I don't identify as non-binary trans friggin furry or anything crazy like that they don't like the fact that I'm just a gay guy <laughs> good news is they're losing their own culture war they created a beast that is eating itself right now. The downside is, and there's a way to deal with it, and I used to say this to my pastor, the difference between winning the culture war and losing the culture war is when a gay couple walks into your church, do you welcome them in the church as a Christian man and pour light into their souls, or do you rain fire and brimstone down upon them because you disagree with their lifestyle, or because the Bible disagrees with their lifestyle? Now, reading the Bible, judgment is going to happen at the pearly gates. I don't need to judge you. But I can get you much closer to God by pouring a little bit of light into you rather than raining fire and brimstone down for him. Kind of like I am more likely to be able to get lucky 
at night and sleep in my own bed with my wife if I whisper sweet nothings in her ear rather than call her fat and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of works. Yeah, like I, uh, just a perspective, on the right side of the aisle, we are uh, very blunt in our language and call everyone snowflakes, but we also get our own feelings hurt. Like, we got called deplorables, and it pissed us off. We proudly hold deplorable meetings every Thursday in our village. Well, now we do. <laughs> now we've owned it. We've turned it back around. But the, but the issue is, if we ignore the empathy that we should have for our fellow man, then we end up bolstering the left's control over the culture in general. So honestly, you can affect culture just by engaging in it, but whenever we start to legislate it, we actually go down a very, very slippery slope because when does it stop? I think the correct way is there will be no commentary in classrooms. You should not be telling white kids that they're irreparably racist or black kids that they're irreparably victims or trans that they're uh, or kids that they should be trans because they drew a picture of mommy uh, of themselves in a Kobe Bryant jer uh, jersey with their mommy and daddy which is a case literally happening in California right now where the teacher says a child is trans but the parents say the child is not and the teacher referenced a drawing of the kid where he drew his self and his family together and the teacher said, well, he drew himself in the dress. He's wearing a Kobe Bryant jersey. It has Kobe's number on it and everything. It even says Kobe on it. But that's the world that we're living in right now. Apparently you draw a baggy jersey and you're trans. Yeah. I'm going to come back to schools for another couple questions. Mike, do you have a question? Or should I just roll for a second? Roll, roll for a second. Okay. We do see that, and I've been putting up story after story after story of what is going on in schools all over the, uh, the nation, as well as going on here in New Hampshire. And I think it's almost the epitome of the culture of war that is going on, with a slight twist. That's it. Social commentary. That's what needs to be banned from schools. Social commentary. Okay. Here you, we are. It's not necessary. Yeah. So here we are with a complete flip. It used to be that we trusted teachers, those of us of my age, which I am now officially a senior citizen. My um, teachers were older. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, just hope that I never grow up to act my age, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Somehow people think that that's not going to be an issue or a problem for me to accomplish. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Nor me. <laughs> um, we see teachers and school administration, whether it's staff members or school boards, really believing that the students that show up are their kids, mm -hmm. and your story illustrates that. The fact that they will lie to parents about the transgender status of their children yep. under their care to their parents is another one. Forcibly transition their nine-year-olds without their knowledge or consent. That is correct. It used to be that we worried about uh, teenage girls being brought by high school or sometimes junior high school staff to Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Now it's just, I mean, that's almost trivial compared to what's going on now. With We're the secret transition closets, the clothes. They're the actually justifying student-teacher relationships. Yes, they they're are. actually trying to justify and normalize it as uh, what what what's the term that they're using right now? Minor um, child affection. attracted, yeah. Attracted. Minor 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 child attracted. Otherwise like, known as pedophilia. Yeah, you know, like and, and, I that's a good way to get shot, and I almost go out on a limb and say, if you're a grown man and you're trying to take a shot at my daughter, I'm going to shoot you. There's not going to be there's not going to be any trial or jury for you. I'm going to shoot you, and I don't miss. There is a higher propensity of female teachers going after their male students 
than what anybody ever thinks about. Yeah, it's actually Robert, Robert, the same Robert, Robert Stacy McKay wrote about that in a book called Sex Trouble. Yeah, there's actually it's a it's the other way around. Most men in those situations are still the aggressors. The problem is, as an adult, you're supposed to know better. That's you're supposed correct. to know better. So, you're not supposed to be engaging in that shit. I mean, don't get me wrong. All right, we so all remember being teenagers. Yes, but <laughs> so we're shifting just a little bit. My question really comes as governor because we see it here happening here in New Hampshire. Oh, yeah. And we make, is fun, there, we make fun of Governor Groomer, not because he is, but because he enables it. Yes. Well, well it started with SB 263 with the, uh, the gender identity as a protected class, and the schools jumped all over it. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there anything as governor, because you're supposed to faithfully execute the laws, yes. rather than create laws, but are there things that you could do within the law to say this needs to stop. There you will need be, to understand who is in charge here. There will be zero recognition of minor attracted persons in the state. That is absolutely freaking ridiculous. Okay, but what about the yeah. teachers and the staff basically having the mindset that the students are theirs and all parents are to be considered guilty? as uncharged. Very simple. Teachers are no longer to make allowed to make social commentary. You're not a health care provider. At the point where you decide that you're going to engage a child as a uh, therapist, well guess what? Now you're acting outside your licensure and your license can be pulled. At that point, you are not a therapist, you are not a social worker. We have actual social workers and therapists in a lot of schools to do exactly that to deal with kids and their issues, whether they're being abused at home or whatever. But your teacher is not supposed to be telling you about their personal sex life, telling you about their personal home life. Hell, if a teacher's a good teacher, you won't know what their political affiliation is. You won't know whether they're married, single, other than the abbreviation in front of their damn name. That's it. it that's literally it. You, you shouldn't... I never knew who my teacher's husbands or wives were or whether they were gay or not. I had a college professor who was so damn good, we didn't know what his political affiliation was. Teaching law, it turns out he was actually uh, worked under Robert Byrd. <laughs> Go figure. But I'll give him credit. His sole methodology was don't care what your position is. You better be able to substantiate your argument. And it's about the law, period. It's not about how you think it should be or your feelings or what. It's U.S. law, not international law, U.S. law. So, but uh, yeah, in general, we need to get rid of social commentary by teachers. Teach all the facts, good, bad, and ugly. Children will make their own damn decisions and largely they'll end up choosing right. Children, more often than not, tend to be morally more, uh, I want to say, on point and over the target than most adults. Because our life experiences tend to push us uh, one way or the other. We, we become compromised morally as we get older. Um, and we should stop allowing teachers to talk about their personal lives with their students. You're not their friends. You're not supposed to be their friends. Same way adults are not supposed to be friends with their children. Right, and, and actually, I, I forget who I had this discussion with very recently about teachers being friends because, in fact, it's the same kind of relationship uh, as uh, getting too close with the subordinates if you're in the military or in, or in business and, and, and teachers with the students. Discipline fails if the teachers are friends with the students. The teachers are a different breed and they should be agnostic of things like this. They, they simply should be, as you say, teaching the facts and keeping their other life out of it. Yeah, the ability to be, and that's something that you learn when you're an adult, the ability to be both friends and a subordinate or a leader at the same time. Yeah. It's something that even in the military we worked out and all it is is understanding the difference between respecting the rank and respecting the man. Outside of work, 
I drink beers with my superior officers and my superior enlisted. Inside of work, I'm answering to the rank they have on their collar, not the guy I drink beers with. Mm -hmm. In the classroom, that's how it's supposed to be. That's, I mean, it's one thing if, say, your teacher has a part-time job and you guys both have the same part-time job. But inside the classroom, your, your job is to teach. Your job is to educate. It's not to make commentary on their personal lives, their relationships, and so on and so forth. It's to make sure that they walk out of that classroom with everything that you were supposed to impart on them. Wow. You got a question? Because I got more. No, it's, it's just kind of a good conversation. Well, I think we already asked. So how, uh, how are you going to get there, Julian? That's the key question. You, you've obviously, you're fired up, you're ready to go. You know what you want to do when you get there. What's it going to take to make Julian the premier candidate in the primary? Let's see, I already spoke to Trump's people, the, the common, or some of his people, the, the common number that I heard for fundraising is $250,000, which is about typical across the entire political spectrum in order to achieve an endorsement from anyone. Unless you have some sort of major viral moment that gets spread around the country by making a fool out of yourself. Um, so I'm going to be on the ground just doing this grassroots the same way that I have been. And pe it's up to people to share what I've been doing and what I've been saying. I just try to remain me. I'm a crass asshole and I will always be the same crass asshole. Uh, and I know the time to put on my suit and tie mm -hmm. and shake hands with people. I also know the time to rain fire and brimstone down upon people. I hope people see that when they when they watch this interview or hear me speak in person. And I never claim not to be a crass act. <laughs> <laughs> I figure there's enough nice guys in the world and there's enough fake nice guys in the world. We don't need any more of them. So I, I'm here to be a warrior. And then I want to ride off into the sunset and grow a big caveman beard and chop wood in the mountains. I've got wood for you to chop if, if I ever feel, uh, uh, feel led to swing an axe. So when I was younger and I had anger management issues, that was my therapy. <laughs> was I'd go outside and just chop wood. Yeah, and then feel warm about yourself later on in the winter. Yep. I like that. It, it's, so there's, there's something far more it's very gratifying. emotionally gratifying yeah. than wrapping yourself around a baseboard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It, it is, it is, uh, but don't get me wrong, I've had those days too, being a, being a Marine, we drink a lot, but, um, between hitting my heavy bag or chopping wood are two of the best ways to get, get rid of anger. One, it's very, very healthy. You, you burn a lot of calories chopping wood. I know. Two, you do get to sit by that fireplace later in the year, or... Uh, when it comes to boxing, it's maybe less likely to not hit the campus, or less likely to hit the campus. So that, that's that's a good thing. But yeah, we 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 have some some issues. When it, trying to to be the next governor, honestly, I'm leaving it up to people to decide. Are you sick of what you've gotten? Are you sick of being told that you can't have better? Are you sick of Voting for someone who says one thing and does something the opposite. Well, Are you uh, sick of people who continuously run for office, who never stop, will always be there, who have no intent on leaving politics anytime soon? Are you sick of people who are just trying to climb the ladder to go to their next office or don't actually believe in the end goal? I mean, that's essentially what we're dealing with with the governor right now. He's not some young, bushy eyed. A uh, young man who may be wrong on policy and is aspiring to do great things. He seeks higher office and mm -hmm. he doesn't believe in the goal of the movement. My goal is I want the state to be a red state for the next 30 years. About a generation. Can't really get, guarantee more than a generation because I probably won't be alive to, to witness it. But for the next 30 years, I want this to be a red state. I want this to go back to what it could have been. We're so, so far, according to Cato Winston, we're the freest state in the country. 
and yet for some stupid reason we're still considered a, a purple state solely because our governor screwed up our redistricting uh, screwed all the CD1 and CD2 candidates out of being able to run actual campaigns the state party does everything it can to sabotage all the grassroots strong candidates here uh, do everything they can to maintain the status quo in the state house the establishment does everything that, on the Republican side of the aisle does everything they can to maintain the status quo while the establishment and the radicals on the left side of the aisle do everything they can to put their boots on their throat. Coming from the Tea Party movement, that exact thing happened back then as we're seeing again now. Yes, that's exactly where I think we're going is the same way that, and I've said this many times, the same outcome of the Tea Party movement. So like uh, Andrew Wilkow, David Webb, Sonny Johnson, uh, Stacey Washington, all those people who, you know, you, all those people who all became, uh, went into media after the Tea Party movement, the people who really believed. And then you had the whole group of politicians that rode the wave into office. If you think that we're not dealing with a MAGA wave right now of people who say all the right shit, but they don't have principles because they have no life experience and their ideals have never been tested by life experience. Because that's the difference. Character and principles. Character is what is formed when your ideals are tested at rock bottom. Principles are what you come out of it with. Well, let well, me change the subject just for yeah. a few more minutes. Because we are starting to get near the end. Okay. <laughs> Hypothetical question. Yes. Biden's now saying we're going to get another epidemic. And in the news we're hearing about monkeypox. This sounds like a cartoon. The, yeah, sometimes I think we're living in one, to be perfectly honest with you, Julian. Yeah. But at some point, you must remember when you first heard, public health trumps everything. Yep. And we then decided to see that we, we, we had somebody who believed that a unitary governor assuming the, the roles of the legislature, the executive branch, and the judiciary branch was all rolled up into his Oval Office. So I'm looking for an answer that can both be rather trite and simple, yep. and then if you dig down deep, it's once again a very multi-leveled one yes, to it answer, is. and hard to answer. We didn't know what was going on at the time, when it first burst upon the scene, and I'm talking about uh, the virus. Yes. Nobody knew what was going on. I walked around with a mask. I'm a biologist mm -hmm. in training. I walked into the grocery stores, glove, mask, the, the whole bit, because nobody knew. It took a few months. There were some governors who went even further than Sununu. Yes. There were some that did nothing and that we praised on Granica. Now we picked a fight with her later on, but uh, Governor Mellon, yep. uh, who said, government's job is to present the information that we, we will treat our citizens as adults. I agree with that. So there's the two, two ends of the spectrum, and the camera can't see me, but adults, you will do as we say, and Sununu is probably about here. What would you have done differently? Let people act like adults. I believe, so um, my background is Homeland Security anti-terrorism with an emphasis on behavioral psychology. I know when you start ordering people, they start to get oppositional. It's almost human nature. We get directly oppositional when we're told to do something because we're all individuals. We're very individualistic, especially here in New Hampshire. I think I think Christy Nome's uh, tactics were the way to go. I think, to a degree, uh, focusing uh, focusing on medical staff and el and uh, elderly homes, elderly stay homes, the way Ron DeSantis did, was a good way to do it. I think 
mandates are exactly the wrong way to do it. I think providing people the most information they possibly can would solve most issues. If you educate the populace, they make educated decisions. The people who are going to do dumb stuff are going to do dumb stuff regardless of how educated you try to make them. And to be honest, you're your own person. You have the right to kill yourself however the hell you want. But we heard from the left all the time, you're going to kill my grandmother. That There's my no safety depends on you. But there was no evidence to actually suggest that. With a virus like with a virus like this, yes, the um, and if you exclude the the two different codes, uh, or I should say, let's include the fact that it had two separate codes: one for dying from COVID, one for dying with COVID. It's a difference between dying in a car wreck where a car wreck where there was a motorcycle present or you dying on a motorcycle. The uh, the circumstances are completely different. But the circumstances matter. And when we go back through all these numbers and we start looking at people who actually died from the virus, I think we're going to see such an astoundingly low number that we might have some serious problems and a lot I hope a lot of heads roll in DC over this. I hope so too. Well, because I, this is this is um like I said, I, I believe that the, the government's job is to educate people to be able to make their own decisions. And to properly and faithfully educate them, not manipulate the, the data so that you get the desired response. Because Fauci saying one day that this would that the, the virus wasn't going to spread if you wear a mask or that if you got vaccinated you can spread the virus, but then you can spread the virus, so you still need a mask. No, you need a double mask, triple mask, quadruple mask, but I don't need to mask, but you need to mask, you need to mask in public. Or now you need to mask in open air. Yeah, it, it's just well, so you, see I, I think the numbers are actually gonna be quite stark because you know, they've given us these numbers that kept creeping up past a million for the COVID deaths, but as you say, if you separate the with and the from, that's 200,000. If you se separate the from COVID into avoidable and non-avoidable, meaning the ones that were gonna die from the disease and the yep. ones that were killed by the hospitals, you're down to maybe 100,000 deaths, and we're already looking at about 500,000 vaccine deaths. They have made a huge, screw up here. It's kind of like the difference between dying from AIDS and di di having AIDS and dying from pneumonia while you have AIDS. Yeah. I did a quick study, uh, not much more than back of the envelope, but reasonable data. Mm -hmm. Our normal rate of death here in New Hampshire is about 32 people a day. Yep. When you go back and look at it, even at the height, there were only two extra uh, deaths per day during the pandemic. Now that it has stretched out, we still have COVID around. They're still counting the numbers, but now instead of two years, we're at three years. We're probably down to 1.25 uh, extra uh, or excessive deaths, as the phrase goes. You will be surprised. It's probably up by 5%. Yeah, so my, my question is, with that, would you do what Governor Sununu did, who has refused to come in for a Glock goblet, and I will tell everybody as they come in, so please don't, don't let people know. Would you have divided the population into essential versus non-essential? Would you have said um, everybody can go about their business, period? Or would you do and say, you're shut down, you're shut down, you can't go worship, you can't do this, you can't do that? Hell no. There's no such thing as essential or non-essential. This is not a state of a, and you know what, I, I really hate it because these are, these were supposed to be martial law war powers. That's right. This is not a martial law situation. This is not a Spanish flu situation. This is not a black plague situation. We could already see that. To be honest, I had seen it before we had the first cases in the U.S. I had already seen the news coming out of China and out of Europe and out of Africa. So I was following it thinking this is something that's really going to be a big deal here because uh, in order to stay as well educated on so many issues as I do, 
I read a lot of international news because you want to know the shady shit that our government does that you where each side is only going to give you half of the story. Read Al Jazeera or BBC or any of those uh, any of those other well, the Daily Mail, which is a bit of a rag, but it. Yeah. Uh, it skews the heart of American news very well. Oh yes, and they love to point uh, fingers at our right. It, Al Jazeera loves pointing fingers at our left-right dynamic. If I want to parse through both the Republicans and the Democrats, I'll look at reason. If I uh, if I really want to dig down deep into something that I know is never going to be published here, I'll go on to I'll use my VPN to go check out a Russian black site. But the, the reality is, if we provide enough information for people, they'll make good decisions. Parsing them into essential personnel, non-essential personnel, what would what we accomplish by doing that? Not a damn thing. I mean, let, let's go down to testing. How many of the uh, essential personnel had to get tested every single day throughout the pandemic? How many of them had to get tested once a week? So we jacked up our testing numbers because how many of them had to get tested on a regular basis? And didn't get tested anywhere, anytime, ever, nowhere. How many of them failed one test? How many of them were infected, asymptomatic with the virus, but failed one test, passed and pa or passed consistent tests, failed one test, passed more consistent tests, and then fa failed another test? Yeah, lots of people like that. Yeah. Now. I had to take consistent tests because I own a commercial cleaning company. We are sanitizing half the state and all the way down to West Springfield, Mass. Like the amount of baricide and sterilicide that we, we went through in our company is insane. And it got really, really expensive. But I had to get tested on a regular basis just to even enter the, the properties of some of our clients because I was never going to get vaccinated. I'm still not vaccinated. I refuse to do it. It's not relevant for me. I'm not in the danger zone. And as far as possible side effects from the virus I am in, or from the vaccine, I am in the danger zone. I'm young, I'm, I'm 35 years old, youngish, because I got off arthritis on everything. But uh, 35 years old and I'm black, which means I'm right up there for myocarditis. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna be taking that anytime soon. But the, the idea is if you educate people, we'll make the right decisions. There's no need to, to go any further. Than that. If you can figure out the risk benefit analysis for yourself, you can make your decision. If you're fed bad data, and you get chased into this, I must be masked alone in my car, I must be jabbed four times and all that, so you're a lost cause. And that's part of it. We've and, wagged and, the and dog for and three and years now. And Darwin will have something to say about that, and we're going to lose a lot of people over the next few years. Yeah, don't, there's always going to be that guy that decides to stand up on his motorcycle butt naked, snorting a line of coke, going down the 95 in the middle of the night. It, to be honest, there are always going to be people who make stupid decisions. But the government cannot create a law for every single person who makes a stupid decision. Shall I ask another? We got ourselves a libertarian here, Skip. Very much so. Let's, see how, let's see how far it goes. <laughs> the first big SCOTUS decision was over abortion. Yes. Now, most people look at it as only an abortion decision, and it's not. It's a federalist, a federalism type yes. decision. However, it is part of the culture war, which we've been talking about most of the, the night, because I figured we'd get more out of you by going that route than not. Yes. <laughs> so, we know that the that Governor Sununu is pro-choice. Yes. Uh, he has kept it under rather tight control, but he's also said that he would make sure that it stays legal here in uh, the state of New Hampshire. And in fact, I have a sneaking suspicion that if given the opportunity, he would uh, roll back restrictions on it. He was not happy when some of that stuff went through in uh, HB2, the, uh, the budget bill. Despite that he made promises to Cornerstone on exactly what he would be passing when he was in office. What, right, when he was running and he outright lied and we published that piece mm -hmm. and you know that's another one of those it was unnecessary because sometimes you make a, pro a campaign promise and there are events that absolutely have to make you do something else. Yep. 
This was not one of them. Nope. So my question is, where do you stand on that spectrum? Because it is a hot button issue for a lot of people here on the right. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life. I don't shy away from it. Don't back down from it. I don't parse words over it. The issue is that if we are going to be protecting life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it all starts with life. According to embryologists, there's a life. According to the legal system, there's a life. Apparently, the only time that medical science and the legal system agree that a baby is not a life is when the mother finds it inconvenient. Personally, the only three occasions that I would agree with abortion is rape, incest, and save the life of the mother. One, rape, rape and incest are acts of force. They're violence. They're, uh, it's a violation of the non-aggression principle. As far as uh, uh, save the life of the mother, again, we all have the inherent right to self-defense, to save our own lives. Other than that, if a bill came across my desk creating further restrictions on it, I'd pass it. Now, if it was a standalone bill, which I got into a very nice argument with a with a beautiful, uh, beautiful elderly lady uh, in Merrimack the other night over this, because she asked me point blank if a bill hit my desk for a standalone bill to get rid of abortion state, would I? I said yes. I said, but, and this is where she got angry with me, there will never be a bill like that that will hit my desk. Never. There's never going to be a standalone bill regarding abortion. Because politicians can't be simple and straightforward. No, not even just that. It's because um, this is an issue. This, this is an issue on the right that we often fail on. So our intellectually pure position is that it is life. And that life needs to be protected, so we will ban abortion. But we also don't agree, we don't believe in government programs of any way, shape, or form. So we will do nothing to fix the foster care system or adoption system. We won't be proactive enough to get rid of them or allow private organizations to fill that gap. We'll just leave them broken in place. Which, with the Sununu Center, hasn't really worked out very well so far. We have a whole bunch of kids that just disappeared. Last time I checked, kids just don't disappear. Well, past the age of five, they don't just disappear. If you ever been out shopping with a toddler, you know they can disappear pretty quickly. But I, I'm pro-life, and I, I believe that if we're going to save the life of the baby, then fix the foster care and the adoption system, fix the opportunities for education and economic opportunity by cutting taxes, deregulating, and allowing as much education freedom as fiscally possible. That way women never even have to make the choice. That also means that as liberty, conservative-minded individuals, we need to do better about pushing and promoting these organizations that try to help women keep their babies. We do more protesting against Planned Parenthood than we do promoting better alternatives. Mm -hmm. Which, in general, is something on our side of the aisle we need to work on. We do far more to protest against the people that we don't like. Like, you can, I guarantee if you were to say, let's go and protest outside the governor's house, I could get 50 people right now to go do it. But if I were to say, let's go sign wave for Don Boulder, maybe 15. I'm just going to check something. But that's that's the era that we're living in right now, is we have uh, everyone is angry, and it's easier to protest against something than it is to... When one of my friends supported uh, um, Care Net, which is now called Real Options, mm -hmm. and she would sponsor up to three tables at her annual banquet. Yep. Last year was, was a stretch. I don't have to help me, and... Uh, there's still the tail end of COVID. I got two tables, but we got some good money in for them. See, I, I believe that our That's future in this right country thing. can be better than it has been, that we can give a better future to our children. I believe in a better future, but the issue is we have to run on what we plan to accomplish, not on what we dislike about the government. Okay. We run too much on the negative and not enough on the positive. 
And with that, I think that's a great note to stop on, at least officially, for this week-lock gauntlet. Um, Julian Assard, candidate for New Hampshire governor, I want to say thank you very much for dealing with both Mike and I, uh, and some of the other questions that came from those who could not be here tonight. No problem. Um, I think you've handled yourself well, and uh, I wish you good fortune on the uh, trail. Rock TV.